Hello, wrestling fans. We're back here at High Spots Arena here in, the, in front of the two wrestling rings. Today, it's our privilege to have the wild-eyed southern boy, Tracy Smothers. Hey! How you doing, Tracy? All right. Just hanging out. Now, I know Tracy's done one of these interviews in the past. Yeah. Uh, so he's going to kind of do the same thing that, that you've done in the past and do it here. We're going to have a couple of updated uh, stories to tell. Uh, a lot has happened since the last time you've done one of these interviews. But we want to go back and talk about some of the, uh, the old historic stuff, talk about some of your career first. And we, uh, we'd like to know, first of all, were you a fan of wrestling when you were a kid? Yeah, I was. Yeah, probably from when I can remember, probably five, six years old or something. Always, uh, I grew up around Nashville, right outside there, a little town called Springfield. And we moved there from West Tennessee when I was about five. And yeah, uh, back then, Nick Gouis' uh, promotion was there. And it was NWA, I guess. And he was kind of like the Vince McMahon of the South, you know, back then, because he had a big area, you know, Alabama, all of Tennessee, Kentucky, and uh, uh, Indiana, Chattanooga, I said that, parts of Georgia, and uh, anybody is anybody that came through there. And back then, it wasn't nationwide TV, so when they come through there, you know, they were new, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, back then, uh, you know, Vince Sr. would send down, you know, Andre the Giant and guys like that, Hulk, before he was, you know, what he is now, and Dick the Bruiser had his own thing out in Indianapolis. You'd see all of them come through, Sheik, Ab Abby, and uh, everybody, you know, and it was, uh, Real interesting. Every Wednesday night was the biggest night ever. You know, mm -hmm. in Nashville, he'd do it. He'd play it up like that and promote it hard. And it's pretty cool. You can see there were big, tough, strong guys and athletes, all of them athletes, ex football players, ex amateur wrestlers, and everything. And uh, it was always interesting. It was always, it was definitely believable back then. Was there any, like, one guy that, you know, that, that was the guy you liked the most? Or was uh, you just a general fan? I remember Bob Armstrong mm -hmm. and Jack Briscoe. And uh, they really stuck out to me. And uh, I liked Dutch, Dutch Mantel uh -huh. growing up. Yeah, yeah, I thought he was a real tough guy. You know, just watching it, you could see who was good and who wasn't just then because I always played sports from eight years old up to sophomore in college. And you respected it, you know, what they could do. And uh, it was interesting. It always kept you, you know, kept you glued to the TV. Yeah, you were quite an athlete. Talk about, uh, you know, not just wrestling, but you were a, a pretty good football player too. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I played four sports in high school. It was a small school. Uh, everybody played everything. I played football, wrestled, baseball, played on the golf team. And I went for a double scholarship in uh, college to Carson Newman College and went there two years. And I had never seen any other, I'd never seen a wrestling magazine because where I'm from, it's grown now. But wrestling magazines didn't come to Springfield. And I didn't know there was any other promotions other than Nick Gouis. And then I saw Georgia Championship Wrestling, and I'd see all the magazines from Vince Seniors. It was Vince Senior then. And uh, I'd see Dusty Rhodes and Bob Backlund and all those guys like that. And I was like, you know, that's pretty pretty cool. And, uh, you know, that's what really got me interested to do it. Mm -hmm. you know? Did you do any amateur wrestling? Yeah, um, I wrestled three years in high school, and I was having trouble keeping my grades up in college <laughs> because it takes much of your time. And Carson Newman was is a hard school really hard private school and uh, so I just played football but uh, yeah I wrestled uh, three years in high school furthest I made I won uh, district and I was second in the regional and I made the quarterfinals of state mm -hmm. yeah our, our team was new we just knew the basic stuff back then and you know and uh, so it was it was pretty tough but it was a lot of fun did you leave uh, school early for academics or did you sustain a knee injury that uh, yeah I hurt my knee um, my freshman my freshman year after the season was over in spring practice and then I cracked the vertebrae in my neck and I had a few concussions then and uh, I wasn't exactly setting college football on fire no. but I wanted to uh, transfer to go to University of Tennessee because that's always my dream to um, you know, play for the Vols, and uh, I gained weight. I ate like, five hamburgers, whatever, get a hold of. You know what I mean? And uh, I just lifted weights hard. And I met Steve Kern, Stan Lane, in the gym where I was working out. They were the fabulous ones then. That's so you met him while you were in college working out? Yeah. Well, I was. I was. I transferred. Uh, I'd come back home from Carson Newman, and I went to was going to Vol State, a community college, and would work out there after school and on my way home. I'd see them sometimes. I'd go in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon. I'd see them in there at different times and just got to talking to them. And I bugged them for about a year because back then it was hard to get in the business. It's real hard. It's not like it is now. Uh, they had you had to really they had to really know that you wanted it. And plus they were real busy on the road and they were doing real good. And uh, back then Jarrett's territory was was real good. 
and uh, they were it was hard for them. The only time they could would be on Sunday mornings, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, so after a, a year of pestering them, of uh, you, you're showing your interest, how did you ultimately convince them to let you? I just kept bugging them. Yeah. I just I just kept bugging. I just kept persisting. Steve Kern made the mistake of giving me his number. <laughs> I'd call him and kept bugging, and finally he got tired of me bugging, and and they. Uh, they uh, trained me and uh, they worked me hard and uh, I'm glad they did. Taught me a lot and they let me go to some shows with them, you know, like that. So I'd really learn sitting in the car and the show they'd tell me how it was done and, and, and everything. And uh, that, was, that was cool. And uh, then they left and they went to Minneapolis for uh, Vern. We had a falling out, I guess, with Lawler or something happened there. And uh, they were real hot then. They went up there and they did the program with the Road Warriors for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'd get anything I could get. and. Uh, you know, I worked for George Gouis some then and got a few shows for Jarrett's, but, uh, um, you know, it was until they come back. But then uh, when they came back, uh, uh, this is a funny story if you want to hear it. Tojo Yamamoto, I don't know if you ever heard the yep. story. He helped me a lot. Gypsy Joe helped me a lot when I worked for George Gouis there. And Tojo was back in with Jerry Jarrett. And I would go, he would tell me, he'd go, you, you don't need to to go uh, work Georgia's shows no more. Maybe you'll come down Fairgrounds, talk to Eddie Marlin every week until he book you. I said, okay. So that's what I did. I was going to school, so I'd go book, I'd bug him. Finally, same thing like that. And he goes, well, he goes, you got the look. You certainly persisted because you've bugged me every week. And so he took me in the dressing room and uh, uh, Jerry Jarrett was sitting there, Eddie Marlin was sitting there, and Tojo was sitting there. And Tojo just right away, <laughs> he says, he goes, he goes, Jerry, I tell you, Eddie, uh, this kid very, very bad. <laughs> said his hookup is bad, his headlock is bad, his punches, oh the shits. His kicks bad, very, very, very bad, very green. Wants to fight all the time. Thinks the business is a shoot. I, uh, you know, it's just very, very bad. I just don't. I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking he's going to help me, but it actually meant that he liked you because otherwise he wouldn't even let you in the dressing room. Because back then you couldn't even go in the dressing room. And if a guy was uh, not booked, he, he would go and check. If everybody was there, he'd have to wait outside. Somebody didn't want to do a job, didn't want to do business, he was gone. Mm -hmm. They'd tell a guy to go get his stuff. and That's the way it was. Dressing rooms didn't connect. You got to finish one time, you better get it right. And if you're working with veterans, they may call it, change it in the ring, and you just hope for the best. And you keep your ears open, your mouth shut. Shake hands with everybody who'll sit in the corner and get out of the way. If they need coffee, you go get it for them. Mm -hmm. you know. But uh, Jerry said right then, he, or, and Eddie, Eddie said, well, says, we got you booked. And uh, uh, I did one show for him. I worked with Barbarian. That was my first match, first match I ever had. It was horrible. He tried to work with me, but I didn't, I'd only been in the ring three times. I had the straps on. They kept falling off of me <laughs> right there. Back then, Jerry Lawler with the strip, pulled the strap. Oh, God, dude, it was heat. Mm -hmm. So I was real worried about that, and I screwed up everything. He tried to work with me, but uh, I, I worked with Kurt Von Hess, and it wasn't much better. <laughs> it was awful. So I went back working for George Gouis and him some, and then finally I got a, a show or two for them, and uh, Tojo said, you'll need to go back to my school. So I went six months to his school every Sunday. I get Friday and Saturdays booked for whoever I could get for. I'd work my job 40 hours a week, and we'd work in there four to six hours. Tojo had about six to eight students. He didn't smarten them up or nothing. I'd have to shoot with all these guys. And it, I'm not kidding you. This is all my kids. And I mean, one by one, and do I mean, it was a shoot. And then when you have you grab a headlock or something, I mean, you grabbed it. If you suplexed them, you suplexed them. And you'd have to fight. Fights would break out, everything. I would literally fight for my life. And I'd leave that building wondering how in the world. I'd go right to the gym and get the jacuzzi and sauna. And I thought, how am I going to work in the morning? Because I was working days. And, and I'd get some during the week, too, because my boss would let me. I was loading trucks, my old job I had when I go to college. I thought, God, how in the world am I going to go to work tomorrow? I ain't going to never make it in this. You know, and, and just really paid a lot of dues for about three years. But I worked out with Tojo for six months. And at the end of the workout, if, I mean, if you grabbed a head, if you, if something wasn't good technique, whatever he's doing, he'd take that kendo stick and he'd hit you right in the ear with it. Mm -hmm. He'd hit you. He'd always pop my right ear right there. And I've lost half of my hearing from other things, too, you know. Um, and uh, he, he would, too. That was the old school way, and he didn't mess around, man. And at the end of the workout, of course, you're doing the squats, push-ups, running and hitting the ropes. I have to do it, too, right there with all of them. Then I have to shoot with all of them. Dude, then we do it again after it was over, and then he'd get you, make you get on your knees, and he would take his, he would do a front kick. With his, he could kick, too, with a front kick with the front of his toe right there and 
kick you in the stomach 10 times. Then he'd take that stick and he'd hit you in the stomach with it 10 times. Now, if you did it to some of these kids today, they'd quit in a minute. Or see you. And I'd already, yeah, yeah, I'd already been trained. I thought, God, why am I? I'd ask him, why am I having to do this? Because you don't know what to do. You'll no good. Never, never make money. Never make money. And it was just crazy. But that's the way it was. I actually mean he liked you. So I don't know. So you, you, so after Stan and uh, Steve left, you were you were still toiling in uh, Tennessee. But I know your first big break occurred down in Florida. So how long were you in Tennessee before you? Uh, oh, I um, was there three years. I kept my old job I had, mm -hmm. loading trucks, and I was on call. My boss was cool, and he knew that's what I wanted to do. He knew I'd got, I'd got out of college to do it, and I'd, I'd tell Eddie Morrow, and I said, please just give me about two hours notice and I'd always bring my gear to work every day I would because I didn't want to do that the rest of my life you know and uh, I wish I would have got my education wish I would have got my degree but um, uh, he would do that I'd be on call and I'd bring I'd bring my stuff like I said I'd sleep during my lunch hour 30 minute break I'd eat real fast and and, and do that he called I'd go and wash up do the best I could you know and go and get on the road travel by myself get in 12 to 2 in the morning be at work at 7 and did that for three years for three years, and uh, uh, and then in '86, Bill Dundee, Bill Dundee uh, had had the book in uh, Louisiana for Bill Watts. I went to work for Bill Watts before I went to uh, Florida in '87, and he came in by the Arkansas because we used to work in that uh, like every, every two weeks or something. No boxing ring on Friday nights. He come in, he goes, I talked to Bill Watts today, and he wants you, you, and you, and he pointed to Coco Ware, Billy Travis, myself. And I, just, I knew I wasn't going to get in full time with them because everybody kept saying, keep your job, keep your job. I said, I don't want to keep that job, man. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and I said, I'll go right now. I said, I don't need nothing but a few days. I said, I can go right now. And it was about a month for a winter. I went down there and was there for six months and, uh, for Bill Watts and you, from one end of the world to the other. And, boy, it was, it was something. Buzz Sawyer was there. Remember him? Mm -hmm. Dr. Death, Steve Williams, Jim Duggan. Terry Taylor, he's the one. He was the booker. He's the one that booked me in there. He gave me my first full-time job. Thanks, Terry. I don't know. Thank him or to hate him. I don't know. But uh, a lot of uh, Eddie Gilbert, God bless him, was there. Dick Slater, uh, Ted DiBiase was in and out because he had his Japan deal and learned a lot from all of them. And Dick Murdoch, masked superstar Bill Eady, and uh, Brett Sawyer, Ricky Gibson, uh, Sting, Ultimate Warrior were there. They were the team the Blade Runners in, and. Uh, um, you know, a lot of good guys and a lot of fun. Worked every night, made you know good money for back then. But it was, it was a lot of try. Learned a lot, and then I went back to Tennessee um, in '86 there for about a year. And uh, uh, Roger Smith, he was uh, one of the assassins. He was Jody Hamilton, one of Jody Hamilton's partners back in the day. It was Dirty Roads or something then. He liked me, and Lawler was the booker, and I got a little break there, and they started using me. Okay, and then uh, uh, that was up, and then in 87, uh, I could see that it was kind of, you know, ending there. So back then there was territories, and you'd call around if you had a connection to do, or sometimes if they let you go, they'd swap talent, mm -hmm. and they, you'd, be, you'd get your notice, and they may see how you would react to it before they'd give you a job somewhere or, or try to get you somewhere, so you just would sell it and do, and, and you know, and, and more or less told me I was done there. So I called around Pat Tanaka. Back then, you just sent pictures. You know what I mean? You know, there wasn't much tapes or any of that. And word of mouth. And Pat Tanaka got me in with Matsuda, Hero Matsuda. And Kevin Sullivan was the booker. And uh, he called, put me with Steve Armstrong and, and was there six months. And um, yeah, was there six months. And uh, that, that's pretty where, yeah, I guess that was a little break there. And uh, that we were together five years. Had you, had you worked with Steve before going down the I knew him. Him and Scott came in for a little while in Tennessee and traveled with them and, you know, and, and, uh, and, and uh, met Bob a uh, couple times there, and they were great people. And I popped when they said that, when he called me, you know, because Kevin called and he goes and, and uh, said he's going to put me with him. I was like, yeah, cool, man. I said, just tell you. And I started February of 87, got an apartment together and uh, hung out and just had a great time. It was a lot of fun, that territory was back then. Then uh, uh, Crockett came in and uh, Dusty, and they uh, took the Florida Territory and made it kind of like, I guess you'd say, like a developmental thing mm -hmm. for uh, Charlotte, you know, there. And uh, um, we were supposed to go when, the, when Crockett's was going down. This was a big mistake. The young guys out there don't do this. Uh, we did this. Uh, we were supposed to start in Charlotte, but we were going to be on the B-shows. 
and they talked about putting us with the Midnight Express, and this was in 87, in the fall of 87, and we didn't go. We went back, we went to Continental, and you know, and wish, wish that we would have went, and because we were supposed to go to um, the old TBS TV and give us four wins on that TV, and we didn't go. And that kind of burned a bridge with Dusty. So when he got the book in 1991, he made us the Young Pistols. So sorry, Dusty, we messed up. Well, why? Why did you choose to go back to Continental? There must have, you must have evaluated the choices. And yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, we'd had a lot of promises that didn't come, which that's part of it. And business changes every 15 minutes. You're young. You know what I mean? You know, you miss being home and things like that. And that was more toward home. And Steve had a wife and kids, and you know, and we weren't making very good, and the, what we were told on the B shows, it wasn't that good either, you know, for the Crockett territory then, and the, and the A shows were kind of going down, you know, the business was kind of going on a downslide then, right. and you're just young, dumb, and you know what I mean, and you just make hasty decisions, and I uh, don't know if we should have done that or not, because uh, uh, wasn't long after that when rock and roll left that first time, if you remember that. Mm -hmm. And then they put the Fantastics in that spot, which were a great team, but it was kind of the same gimmick where right. ours was a different, you know what I mean? Right. We might have had a shot at that, who knows? But he was going to put us with the Midnight Express, which we weren't true or not, we didn't know. So, you know, it, it, it's just, uh, we should, I guess we should have checked it out and found out. But that worked out good in Continental, and then we got back in WCW in uh, 1990. Well, who came up with the name the Wild Eyed Southern Boys? Kevin Sullivan. Yeah. Kevin Sullivan did that. That was his gimmick. Sure did. Who sure were some did. of the other guys that were on, on top uh, of the Florida promotion that you were working Back with? then? Mm -hmm. uh, well, Kevin. Kevin was the booker. And even when Dusty and them came in, uh, Kevin still did. Bill Dundee came in and had the Mod Squad. They were a great team. They're from somewhere around here, aren't they? Anderson, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. That's around this area, right? Mm -hmm. They were there. Um, Mike Rotunda came in and he would work with Dory. Dory lived in Ocala. And he would work with Dory every night. And uh, Dusty would come in some, bring the Road Warriors, Rock and Roll, Barry Windham, you know, and all those guys. Was there a the big horsemen. And was there a big spike in attendance when they brought, you know? The, oh, yeah, the, you know? yeah, yeah, they do that. Barb, we work with Jimmy Valiant, Barbarian. And, uh, um, but the regular guys there, Ed Gantner, he, he died years back. Scott Hall, Scott Hall was in there. He was in there then. And uh, he had come from Minneapolis. Uh, we used to travel together every day. Um, trying to think who else that did well. Brady Boone, if you ever remember that name. Brady, he's from around here somewhere, isn't he? I think uh, Raven was down there too at that time, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he came in after. Johnny Ace actually came Johnny in. Ace. Johnny Ace. Everybody hates him now, don't they? <laughs> but anyway, Johnny came in. If you're working in. for him, you don't. Huh? If you're working for him, you don't hate him. No, I don't, you know, I'm not working for him. But, <laughs> but anyway, Johnny came in in 87. And I can remember Hawk come up and goes, guys, Joe's, Joe's going to ask you if you'll take care of his little brother, okay? So he's going to ask you, okay, guys, he's, he's a good kid. Just like that, you know. Of course, Joe, Joe was a real straight-laced good dude. You know, everybody respected him, and he did. Johnny traveled with us every day and, and had a big time. And I guess he, he was, did the sheep herders thing after that, carried the flag right. and all that. Yeah. Yep, he did all that. And um, I'm trying to think who else. I guess that's about it. Now, when you went back to Continental, you uh, had a feud with the Stud Stable there. Do you, mm -hmm. you remember yep. any of the memories? We worked with the New Breed in Florida. I didn't mean to get ahead oh, of no, myself, but the New Breed, uh, Chris Champion, Sean Royal, mm -hmm. worked with them. Dusty really liked them. Took them up there, and they were getting ready to work with Midnight. They were going to turn them babyface, and then they had the bad wreck. Mm -hmm. That's how the business is. You know what I mean? That's how it is. And then, yeah, we went to Continental, worked with Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden. And that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. He's crazy. But uh, that, was a, that was a great place to work. It was a, it was a real laid back, just like Florida was, too. It was real laid back. We'd go fishing on the way to the towns and stuff. Like, hey, you get there in time, bell, just call, let them know you're coming, you know. And, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, I worked with them for about a year. was there in 88, and then uh, um, in the fall of 88. And we were there about a year, and then we started going to Japan. We went from 88 to 90, and I went back to Tennessee for about eight, nine months there. And... Um, yeah, you originally started, the first tour of Japan, I believe you had, was with New Japan. How did you get mm -hmm. hooked up with New Japan? Uh, Matsuda, Hiro Matsuda, Hiro from Florida. He uh, uh, was they're looking for tag teams and looking for young guys to go, and uh, uh, Hiro's the one we talked with. And he, 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 back then, he was booking the American talent, you mm -hmm. know, for, for New Japan. What was your first impressions of going over to Japan? Oh, man. It's a lot different than Tennessee and Florida, huh? Yeah, 
oh yeah, one thing, the steering wheel's over here on the right and they drive on the left-hand side of the road and we they're 13 hours ahead and I've never been on a plane flight that long in my life. And uh, I can remember, uh, remember the Brazos, Mexicans? Yeah, Brazos. Brazo Brazos Brothers? Mm -hmm. They were on the bus with us. We couldn't speak Spanish. And, you know, and uh, they couldn't speak English. Steve could speak a little Spanish. He'd get his book out and stuff and do all that. And, we're on the, and it was raining, and I remember watching them play baseball. And, of course, you work over there, and, well, you got to go. Uh, on top then was uh, Fujinami, Korsunoki, Sagaguchi, uh, Fujiwara, uh, Koshinaka, uh, Muda. That's what, around that tour there is when Brody got killed, if you remember that, in Puerto Rico. So Muda came back in, Chono and Hashimoto, and they were putting them together as that Three Musketeers, and, and uh, they were doing that and getting that going, and that popped it again. They were doing great business. But they treat you first class. We did four tours from 88 to 90 there before uh, uh, we went to WCW. And then they brought the Russians over, and it kind of cut that off, and then we got the job over here with them. They brought them over, mm -hmm. um, all the Russian shooters. So you, you were able to get back into WCW, uh, was that 88 or was that? Uh, no, it was 1990. 90. 1990. They, they, they changed their name to the Young Pistols. Well, yeah, we were there about a year as the as uh, uh, Southern Boys, Wild Eye Southern Boys, and we uh, worked uh, with uh, Midnight Express on the Bash, Great American Bash. First uh, class of the champions worked with the Freebirds, and uh, uh, they, they put us over and... Uh, right there on, in Charleston. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the next one was the Bash with uh, Midnight Express. And then uh, we, we did a program with the Freebirds there for about a year. And then uh, when Dusty come in and got the book, uh, they were just saying because of the rebel flag thing was real controversial and uh, wanted to do something different, so kind of like cowboys, like urban cowboys kind of, and the Young Pistol thing in there, and that turned us heel right away. <laughs> We had better heat as, as, as baby faces we did at heels, but that turned us heels. But uh, we were there about another year. So they're two and a half years. Mm -hmm. and, you know. Did you say that when Dusty came back that he had any resentment because of the choices you made? <laughs> I don't know. He may still do. I don't know. But uh, uh, he, he pulled us aside and said we'd come up with something, you know, different because uh, uh, the corporate people, you know, it were, and they were getting a lot of bad negative feedback on the on the rebel flag thing, mm -hmm. and kind of change your gimmick and do because they were going a lot up north, you know what I mean? Right. And you wouldn't get well received up north, and wouldn't keep y'all as a babyface team, something that would be, you know. And then they said we're from Wyoming, but uh, um, uh, that that too, get rid of the whole southern the southern gimmick period on that, you know, because it was a nationwide deal, mm -hmm. and they wanted to keep us babyfaces, so they uh, did that. How about some of the memories of your matches with Midnight Express? Oh, yeah. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what. Bobby Eaton back then was the best. Everybody in the dressing room. Of course, the nicest guy in the world. You know, but uh, uh, he was the best. I learned a lot from him. He, he was amazing. And uh, Jim Cornette had a mind, like, you know, you just couldn't beat. And he could come up with some great finishes and great just lay out the whole match. And uh, all we had to do was just listen. and try not to mess it up. And Stan Lane had a great presence and a good character with his whole, you know, his whole thing there. And he, of course, he helped train me with Steve. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, that was great. They were, they were phenomenal. Bobby Eaton was out of this world. He really was. He really was. He really was. All right, another tag team might, might have been more of a challenging uh, for you was uh, the Master Blasters. Yeah, a little yeah. Di different type of guy than, than uh, mm -hmm. Midnight would be. Yep. Uh, we worked with... Uh, Kevin Nash and uh, was Al Big Al Green, Al Green, um, on his first pay per view. Mm -hmm. Brad and Tim Horner worked with him in his first match on Clash in Asheville, and uh, we worked on his first pay per view. And God, he was strong. Grizz would, Grizzly Smith would say, "Teach him something every night." He'd throw me from here to the ball over there, you know. But it, uh, but he'd soak it up, and he he had a good mind. You could see that he was going to make it because uh, he was with it. You mm -hmm. know, he was with it. Now that you were in WCW around that time, where they they changed uh, bookers pretty often. Yeah. Can you lead us through some of the bookers that you started to work for while you were there, and, and maybe some of the the changes you saw as a, yeah. as a talent? Uh, when I got there, they had the committee, and it'll be Eddie Gilbert, Kevin Sullivan, uh, Cornette, uh, Flair might have been kind of had some say so in there, uh, and uh, Jim Herb was running it. You remember him? Mm -hmm. Oh God, he wasn't a wrestling guy, you know, at all. And so they conflict with him pretty pretty hard. Then Ole got the book. Ole, Ole liked us. 
oh, he browbeat us all the time. I mean, he liked you, you know, but, but he, he liked us. And that's Michael and them asked to work with us because they've been working with the Steiners fighting for their life. And, you know, Michael Hayes helped us a lot, and he did, him and Jimmy, Jimmy Garvin. And, uh, um, and you know, Ole had the book, and then Dusty came in. You know, he then Dusty was the booker, and then uh, Kip Fry, I believe was his name, mm -hmm. he was there for a while, and then Bill Watts came, Bill Watts. And but Dusty was still the booker, and Bill Watts did some house cleaning, and he let about 15, 20 guys go, and I was one of them. Why, why do you but, think you were on the chopping block there? Well, we'd been there two and a half years, and they'd pretty well had us heel one year and babyface a year, and it's pretty well up, and you know, and uh, uh, they were just going different directions, and they had a lot of, uh, you know, he had a lot of new people coming in, a lot of new faces and stuff like that. And a lot of guys that he had worked for him before got let go. I mean, but, but Terry, some of that, you were saying, because you, know, you were up and down, baby face heels, a lot mm -hmm. of that is just because of the changes that you had as the bookers changed. Yeah. It's, were, it's, were there any bookers that you felt were better for, your, for, your, for you, what they did more for you than another? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I don't... I, I look at it, I don't blame anybody for anything. I look in the mirror and you ain't got to go very far. You know what I mean? I've messed up and, and things like that. But I, I mean, Dusty had, a, Dusty used us okay. And Ole liked us. And, uh, and you're talking about just in WCW or right. period? Right, just WCW. Yeah, uh, uh, Ole liked us and uh, uh, Dusty liked us. We, he, we had a, a good run there with Dusty. And then when Bill Watts came in, there was a lot of guys when their contracts were up pretty well, they were done. You know a lot. You know what I mean. You know, and that's that's pretty well what it was. Um, uh, Steve had a problem with him, um, something with his music, and he didn't sign his deal on the second deal, second year. So that ended up, and they eventually let him go. He didn't want to sign away his music. And about the last six, seven, eight, nine months, I um, well, I you, just did TVs. When you said uh, you didn't want to sign away his music, tell tell us what you mean by that. He uh, uh, did some music on his own and was wanting to market it. And I guess they talked and, and did, and they wanted to, to go with that. And Steve, could, he could sing really good. I mean, his brother Jesse could, too. And uh, he wasn't comfortable with signing it away to him. He wanted to kind of do it on his own. And they wanted to do something with that, and they were kind of butting heads. And I don't think that he just kind of left it alone and didn't sign it. And then when it got to where, and that's before Bill Watts come in, I believe, and then it got to where uh, there were some cutbacks, you know, and, and, and that's what happened. They just didn't have nothing for me those last seven, eight months. So I just did TVs, and I just got custody of my son, and I bought a home, and I couldn't leave when he did. I couldn't do it because the first thing, I'd have lost my son, and I'd have lost my home, you know, and I just I couldn't do it because they do the checks with the social services, human services, on, you know. And I, so I just played golf and did TVs and then did, you know, went down every two weeks or every week, once a week, and did it. And uh, when my contract was up, it was up. You know, that was it. Now I have a comment, and I don't know if you said it or if it was said indirectly to you, that you considered leaving wrestling after you were done with WCW. Was yeah. That, was that true? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you did your homework. You're right. Uh, Jim Cornette called me for about a year when him and Stan walked out. Off and on, you know, he'd have time to time and said he was working on something. And of course, that ended up being Smoky Mountain. And I was, I was discouraged. And whenever you got let go, you're down. You know, you're pretty down. You, you really are. And uh, I was looking at other things. And uh, he, he uh, talked with me and just said, you know, hang with it. Don't get down. It's just the business. And you'll go through changes like that. And, you know, he, he really did. He really did. He cared. And I would have got out probably in 92. I really would if it wouldn't have been for him. I would have got out. I, I was just, just, man, my hair was falling out. I was just sick of the politics and, you know, just, uh, it just wasn't any, it wasn't fun anymore those last six, seven months. And then I had a little lull there between uh, jobs, between WCW. I got like, uh, I guess I finished about the end of August in 92. And I started with Jimmy in November of 92. And I worked uh, security for a, a big group in Nashville do a lot of stuff with country music stars called Rock Solid. Mm -hmm. Did that for a few months. But they put you in these bars, crazy places, to get the good gigs to, to deal with them. And I uh, had a couple opportunities to work uh, security, bodyguard for uh, a couple of people. Uh, Brooks and Dunn uh, was talked with a guy about possibly uh, uh, being a relief driver on the road and work security for them and, and everything and uh, uh, just go with them everywhere. And 
I didn't follow up on it because I wanted to wrestle. You know, I was getting, you know, I'd stay, I did a, a TV, I guess, for him in October, and they'd do three tapes, and then I started full-time with him in November of 92. Yeah, and I'd go to Japan uh, four or five times a year there during that time, too, and to take a break from there, and I was there until it shut down in 95. Yeah. Talk about what was, uh, what was Jim telling you? Because Jim started around this time, started Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he went against the grain in terms of speak where everything went national. He went back to doing a regional product. Yeah, yeah. Tell us what his uh, dreams were and what he, he discussed. Uh, he with came, you about he it. came to Columbia, South Carolina, just before I finished up. And uh, I was doing the, the young pistol thing. And he told me, he said, don't get rid of that rebel flag. He wouldn't tell me exactly what he was doing, you know. And then uh, when he just wanted to go throw back to the old territories and did just the, you know, then the little towns and the little, like the kind of like the old Crockett TV would do, you know, on the uh, worldwide, is that what it right. is? Wanted to have that old school feel and do and what he wanted there. And he wanted me as the, the uh, rebel gimmick because up in the hills, man, they, the, Clan, everything. I'm not kidding you either. East Kentucky, uh, East Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. I have them guys come up on me, and I'm a country boy. It's a little different. Country boys are different than hillbilly. They're crazy, man. They're incest, inbred. I don't want to. That's true. And they're nuts. And if they want to check you out and see if you're the real deal, and he, he wanted that old type feel, and that's, that's what he had. But uh, some of it's rural areas, and, and the economy's not real good, so it was kind of tough. The first runaround was good. But then in summertime in the mountains, it wouldn't do good because people were outside. And in the day, always, summer would be your good time. So he'd put his best angles in the summer. And it was tough because the people weren't watching. They were outside. Because when it snows there, I mean, you don't hear about it. I mean, you can just come over a hill and it could be like a blizzard. It could be 70 degrees in Nashville and be there and three, in, you know, four or five inches of snow on the ground, you know. And, uh, uh, he, but he wanted that old type feel and the old fa fashion, like Memphis, you know, small territory type feel is, is, is what he wanted. And uh, uh, that's what he did. That's what he did. And then, of course, he got in with uh, Vince, and I guess in 93, mm -hmm. I think it was. And then he'd, he would go up there once a month and do, and then he kind of started gearing it to big shows and to do that, you know, and like Thanksgiving Thunder, Christmas Chaos, stuff like that. And people got educated to that. And so you just get the diehards in the monthly towns, you know, some, and then uh, and some of them in the spot shows would wait to come to those and, you know, some things like that. And, uh, but were all, were all you guys making a living on the Smoky Mountain yeah, Wrestling? Yeah, I, he'd, he'd go 14 to 16 dates a month, mm -hmm. usually, and I'd get independence around that because that TV go in a lot of areas. And uh, I'd sell the Rebel Flags, bandanas, uh, you know, uh, shirts. Uh, of course, pictures, you know, everything, Polaroids and do rock and roll used to do awesome there. Mm -hmm. And I do good on the bandanas and flags. That was my thing. I do the picture free, you know. And he'd give us a salary and do that. And sometimes they have trouble getting it. And then I guess the guy, uh, something with Black Crows was his backer. And he'd have to call him out, out west and, uh, you know, and, and uh, make it up, you know. But uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Tony Anthony, White Boy, Rock and Roll, Brian Lee. Um, all those guys used to all travel. Tom Pritchard, you know, and um, Jimmy Del Rey, of course, Cornette, and Armstrong's coming in and out some. Bob, especially, was always there. You have a favorite match or angle in Smoky Mountain? That, that it's Chris Candido, got to mention him, yeah. and Tammy Sitch. Uh, it's hard to say a favorite, but I think, uh, well, I guess uh, probably, probably Chris Candido. Of all of them, then Dirty White Boy. All of them were. It was. I worked with Brian Anderson. Worked a program with him. Uh, did tag program. Me and Tony Anthony did the Thugs uh, with uh, Heavenly Bodies. Did that and uh, worked with Unibomb, which is Kane and Al Snow, the Gangsters. Mm -hmm. Oh God. <laughs> oh, and all how, them. How did the Gangsters go over? And you described what the towns were like. Oh man, the first time they did TV, I'll never forget it. It was somewhere in North Carolina, right on the border of like North Carolina and Tennessee, and it was Klan City, believe me, the cops. Cause they'd come up to me, and you know, and, and cause they check you real quick to see if you're a real dentist, it's just a gimmick to me. I mean, we're all God's children, we bleed red. You know what I mean, we're all, I don't, I'm not like that. It's just, I was doing to make a living, try to sell bandanas and flags. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, they did their interview, and I'll never forget it. They brought all them guys from the parking lot. They were legit gangsters, had their colors on and everything. And Jack and Mustafa went, and that's maybe before D-Lo got there. Maybe D-Lo was there. Uh, but uh, uh, 
they came from the parking lot and circled the ring and did, did this interview. And this was right when I had trouble with OJ. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And he goes, and he says, uh, um, and, and he did the racial interview, did it all. I mean, he did it all right there. I'm sitting there going, oh, God. Then he finished it with this. I'll never forget it. And he goes, oh, and OJ, shout out to my boy OJ right there. He says, keep up the good work. We got two of them we don't got to worry about. We got two of them down right there. I was like, Everybody died in the dressing room. And I knew what was up right there, and I saw the cop coming at the top of the steps right there. I like, went, hold on, man, you know, and uh, went up and talked to him. I said, hey, it's just a gimmick. It's what we do. I smartened him up. Back then, you didn't really do that, but I did because I didn't want any trouble. He goes, okay. He goes, okay. He goes, but we don't play that shit around here, okay? It's like, okay. He goes, you need to get out of here. Get, get out of this town. Need to get out of this state. So he said, I didn't tell them that because I knew they'd go out and be trouble and all that. And do. And he said, he needs to get them damn boys out of the parking lot. <laughs> I remember that. I said, no problem. I didn't, I didn't let Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, what are you trying to do? You're going to get them guys killed. Well, Jack really worried about it. He drove a green Corvette to the show. Yeah. It was the first loop he did. So it do, was, do you think that uh, Jim really wanted to push it that hard? Because, I mean, he pushed it hard. He did. He did. They did a video in the hood. And I, from what I understand, they were going to have a, one of the, uh, like Coke or Pepsi, a big sponsor pulled out, was going to work with or something like that over there and did the, did the interview in the, and did the video in the, in the hood there. And some of the, it drew some, they drew pretty good there. They did with rock and roll. And then Tony and I worked with them. And then Scott Armstrong and I did, and then they did the thing where we brought Undertaker in, mm -hmm. uh, in the bluegrass brawl, brought him in. But it then kind of started hurting a bit because some of those people, they get so mad, they just turn the channel. You know, it was kind of like that. And, uh, uh, but you can't say it's their fault. They're just doing what they're told, right. you know, and they worked their butt off. I never had any problem with them. Uh, 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 to this day, I see all three of them, and they treat me like gold. I don't see Mustafa anymore, but I see Duo and New Jack, so, you know. You and they went from there, of course, to ECW. Yeah. You know, and a lot of guys came out of there and did well, you know. You had a you had a ladder match with Chris Candido at yeah. uh, Bluegrass Brawl too, and it was uh, around the same time the you know what people talk about when the famous uh, Shawn Michaels yeah. Scott Hall, well, was it deliberately booked that way because you knew that they were doing yeah well we Jimmy Jimmy of course was working for uh, you know WWF was then, mm -hmm. and uh, Scott and Kevin or Scott and uh, uh, Shawn were doing those matches and I didn't know nothing about a ladder match I was like what a ladder match. With Chris, oh my God, because he's a suicide, he was crazy. Nobody was doing all that then. Chris Candido I said, oh Lord. But they were they were doing those around the loop and house shows. And of course, then they, was it WrestleMania they did it on? Yeah, and so that's where he got the idea from. And uh, Jimmy would bring the, uh, a lot of the smart marks up once a year. And, you know, and they, they'd come up to the shows for like a convention thing and do and come for the whole week and, and everything. And they come up and they tell us all these spots. They tell me all these spots. Chris would want to do them <laughs> that Sean and Razor were doing. I said, look, because the word around then, I said, look, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make what I'm making here tonight. And I'm glad to make it. And I'm doing okay on gimmicks here tonight. I said, but I ain't quite making what they're making. They got a hundred grand for that WrestleMania match a piece. Right. I said, you come up and you bring me that kind of money. We may talk about it then, <laughs> you know. But uh, uh, we sure couldn't do what they did. I couldn't. Chris could, but I couldn't. And he was Fine young man. God bless him. The, uh, did you see any changes in the way, uh, you know, Cornette, you're going to burn yourself out doing what Cornette did for as long as he did. Did you see any changes in Cornette from when he started to when uh, Smoky Mountain wrapped up? Well, it's, it's really too much for one man to do, you know, because he was trying to balance that, and he, he don't like to fly. He'd drive all the way up in the northeast and do those TVs, and I guess he had some input then with, you know, with some of the booking there, and, and uh, he kind of started gearing it to big shows in a small territory. You can't really do that. You want to go for that steady thing. But it got pretty tough for him because he'd have to do that to keep it going. So, you know, he, did, he it was just too much for one guy to do, and uh, uh, it was hard. It was really hard, and, uh, and you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was tough on him, and it just wasn't enough hours in the day or night to do, and, and uh, uh, he worked his ass off. I mean, he did. He he broke down crying when it shut down, you know, and and uh, and of course he went, you know, up there and everything. But uh, uh, when it was doing, when they were just doing the steady angles, whatever, when, and he found out too, of course, that he he saved his good stuff that first summer there, you know, for real good things for uh, the summer, which he thought would draw. But in the mountains, it, it was a winter territory, you know, mm -hmm. in fall, 
would do better. And of course, you don't know until you go, and, right. but then that happens. You learn you know? later. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know if this is a fair question to ask you because you weren't a promoter at that time, but do you think uh, there's anything he could have done then or anything you do now to keep a territories like that, a regional territory, up and running? Because you don't see that anymore. It no, just, you it don't. It doesn't exist. You don't. Um, first of all, you've got to have solid workers from top to bottom. You've got to have angles. Some type, every match has to mean something, you know, and it's really tough because the people are so smart. It's hard to swerve them. And it's, it's real hard. But if, if it's done right, you've got to get sponsors. You know, you got to have that. You got to have. You got to get that, and uh, you've got to get the schools involved. You've got to get the kids involved, and, and it's real hard because all. That, of course, they see WWE and TNA, which you hope TNA keeps coming up, and it's good for the business. But um, it's it's real hard. You got to have everything hitting on all cylinders. You really do. You can't have any problems, any trouble that puts a black eye on the whole thing, and you know those things happen. You know how it is. Wrestling mm -hmm. equals drama. And some things like that can will happen, and it all becomes like a family. And you got to and two, uh, I know probably I should have been turned heel somewhere in there. You know things like that. And you got to have you got to switch your talent around, switch faces. And he'd bring some guy. A lot of talent come through there and did, but some maybe like myself might have been there a little too long. That's why I try to go to Japan four or five times a year, and, and be a little a little fresher and do. But. Uh, uh, you know. Yeah, you actually went back, uh, but you went back to all Japan instead of New Japan. What? Uh, yeah, I, I worked for Wings, and then it was IWA Japan. I did two tours for all Japan, and uh, then uh, they started cutting their crew down from 14 to 16 guys to about six to eight. Mm -hmm. You know, and and they used about the same guys. So, uh, you know, I went 18 tours total to mm -hmm. Japan for about five different offices, something like that. But uh, you said Hiro Matsuda got you New Japan. Yeah. Who, who got you? Uh, these others. All Japan. Uh, well, uh, Stan Hansen. Mm -hmm. Stan Hansen did got got me in All Japan, and uh, uh, when we were in WCW, he liked us, and we told him back then we were we had not weren't going then. We of course for WCW, we told him we worked for New Japan, and back then you didn't really jump. Right. And then in '92, when I was let go, uh, they were already working with New Japan. WCW was and had their certs special, you know, certain guys that they were sending over there. So it was open, it was just wherever I could get. So I got, went, like I said, Wings, a few tours, then IWA Japan, and then uh, uh, I called Stan, you know, because I wouldn't, uh, I, that was, like I was kind of up there, and I got two tours with them, and then they cut back, and then I went back to IWA Japan, right. you know. What did you think about, the, you know, IWA was a very big break from the traditional Japanese wrestling. They, you know, they promoted more of the hardcore yeah. style and stuff. Do you, do you like that style, or are you, are you more traditional? You know, like Get a breath in here. A little cotton mouth. Um, well, you know what? When I got let go, <laughs> I got back booked on that IWA Japan, and they had me as the evil Jason under a hockey mask and all that. And uh, next thing I knew, my first show there, I was under the ring and had all this gimmick on and everything. And I got a place for a bucket where I could piss bucket, and I uh, had some water down there and everything. And it was like 20 something degrees, and they don't heat them buildings, they don't air condition them. I was freezing, man. And guys, they do them ceremonies. They were stomping on the ring, ribbing me. I was there from four o'clock to about nine o'clock up under that ring before I come out on the good Jason and jumped on him. And I was mad when I come out. I thought. What in the world am I doing wrong here? Why I'm up on the ring and I'm about to freeze, man. I'm getting pneumonia under here. And, but it was fun. It was fun. Victor Quinones ran it, and, and he used me a lot of tours, and he always was good to me. And a lot of his, the boys from Puerto Rico and some American guys were coming over. And uh, it was kind of fun doing that monster gimmick. I could come out and chase people and everything like Vader and them used to do and, you know, ramsack the whole arena and everything. It was fun. Pogo, working with him wasn't much fun. He was a cheap shot kind of guy, you know, but uh, uh, it, it was it was fun. It was fun. Tell me a little more about Pogo. It sounds like there's a little bit of a story there. Yeah, well, uh, I had that mask on. I had that mask on, right, the Jason mask, and I worked with him somewhere, tag or something. It was in Corken Hall, and yeah, and I came in, and uh, he said that uh, he was holding his head. He goes, oh, uh, last night you hurt my head very bad uh, on headbutt, uh, nose on mask, you know, very much, very much hurt. 
big lump right here, right here, very bad. I said, hey, sorry, man. I said, this new gimmick. I've always been just a traditional wrestler. You know, this, this, this. I said, sorry about that. I'm sure you'll give it back. Like that. Well, they had spots in there where you do and um, in the finish. Where I'd take a lot of hardcore stuff from him and then come up, do the Undertaker thing set up and then, you know, get on him, right? Well, uh, he, uh, uh, they do the thing with the chairs and these chairs break pretty easy. It's a lick, but with that mask on, you can take the brunt of it too. But uh, um, he'd do it with the opposite end of it when the screws would come right out. So it'd break over you and do it, and it sounded off good, and it wasn't that bad. He hit me with the other end. I saw the blue end, and it sounded like a shotgun went off. And uh, um, he hit me with that, and I just went down, and, and of course, take a bump there. Didn't have to worry about taking a bump. I did anyway. And uh, then he closed on me and go out over the top, and then I was going to get juice. This smart interview, right? I can say that, right? I was going to gig right there and felt my head, didn't have to gig because I had juice. And then come back in, and the next spot was he shoots me in and hits me with a baseball bat. With a, I didn't know he was going to shoot me in. I thought he was going to hit me with it. He shoots me in, and I didn't know what was coming. He takes that baseball bat, and he hits me in the chest with it, with the spikes on, you know, with a uh, barbed wire. Like, it's bent back, but not a lot, and that was that was not much fun. But I had the coveralls and the shirt on under it, and, uh, oh, God, I thought he broke my sternum. So I'm down right there and did, and then he took the bat and hit me again. He hit me in the back with it, and then he took that noose, and he wrapped it around my neck right there, and he tried to actually really choke me out and did that, and I was, like, pulling right there to keep my breath right there and do it, and then my next spot is to come up and beat the shit out of him, and that's what I did. I, I, I was just trying to sit there probably going, oh, God, I'm going to get this Jap son of a bitch. You know, and I just come up right there, and, and I just tackled him and went through the ropes. I think I flew off the apron right there and just tackled him, drove him through the things. I beat up a couple of the young boys. I beat up one of the press guys. I hit him with cameras. I hit him with chairs. I, I took a table, hit him with it. And there, was a, there was a pitcher in the uh, uh, Tokyo Sports I mean, hit him with a fan. <laughs> so the next day, so, and he had them suction things. He did that. And he beat up a couple of the young boys a little bit after that. He did. He was real mad. And uh, uh, maybe down in the dressing room or something. I don't know. But I knocked him out. I knocked, yeah, I knocked him out. I knocked him out. I left him over in his blood. I beat, I tried to kill him. No, in the, in the, in the, in the stands right there, right there. And I was trying to kill him. He was covering up and doing, and I was just screaming, cussing him, and hitting everything in sight, chasing everybody all Rita. But I mean, I was hurt, man. I was hurt bad. And the next day, I, and the next, and, and I went to him in the dressing room after. I said, "Everything okay? Everything cool? Good. All right. Thanks, man. You fucking asshole." <laughs> I did that right, you know. But he was real dangerous. He would pile drive guys, and he just opened his legs up and just drive them down. He didn't take care of them at all. And I don't know if he's still is he still alive? Yeah. He's Is still he working. He's still working? Good Lord. He's crazy, man. But uh, anyway. Were you, uh, were you in wing when Doug Gilbert was over there? Yeah, Under I was Road? there uh, two, let's see, when it was wing, IWA. I was with him yeah. in I, when his IWA. I was with him on his first tour, and I was there about three tours with him, something like that. Were you there when he was under the mask, and then he shot on the promotion? No. Taking off the mask? I, I uh, um, came in the tour after that, I believe. Him and Eddie, when they yeah. did that. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, something happened with the Moon Dogs or something. Is that right? Yeah, and there was heat on the American wrestlers after that. They wouldn't bring them to Japan because of what he did. Was that, did that have any influence on you going back to Japan? No, why you no. I, uh, you know what? I think I worked for I was work, I worked the two tours for Baba then during that time when that happened. And I believe I was on the I was over there for Baba uh, when that happened because the Japanese press guys come up and told me. Because I remember they go, uh, yeah, Doug Gilbert, uh, Eddie Gilbert, maybe they uh, unmasked the uh, show the other night. Because it's all in the magazines. Because you saw it in the magazine. When they had the mask on, they showed them with the mask off. And they were just going off on the mic right there. And Yeah, that was a big deal. But that was maybe my second tour with All Japan. And then shortly after, I went back with them. Maybe three or four months after that. Something like that. I don't know. I, I think they were mad about something happened with the Moon Dogs, And they sent them home or something? Yeah. Or? Like like out. Yeah. So uh, you were working all Japan at the time too. Can you talk about some? Because some of the young, super, the superstars that are now were young back there. Like yeah. Kobashi, uh, Misawa, Kawada. Mm -hmm. Did you get the opportunity to work with them? And sure did. It? Sure did. Kobashi, Kobashi, yep. uh, Misawa, uh, Akinama. Um, um, what's some of the ones now? If you tell them their names, I could tell you. Misawa, Kawada. Yeah. Kikuchi. Kawadi worked with him. Who'd you call him? 
Hoochie Hoochie. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, yeah. you worked with Steve Williams and Joel Deaton. You te yeah. teamed with them. Yeah. How yeah. were the experiences with that? I think you were one of the real world tag leagues with them. Uh, um, when Terry Gordy, when that happened with him, when he OD'd, do you remember that? When he did that? Uh, I tagged with Doc a lot on my first tour, Steve Williams, and he really turned it up. I was in 93 and uh, um, worked a lot with, with Steve Williams as a tag, you know, in tags with him, six mans, stuff like that. And I uh, did some uh, six mans when on the second tour there a lot with uh, some with Stan Hansen and Ted DiBiase when he was left w WWF in that and uh, got art, like I said, with Mazawa a lot, Kobashi a lot, he was the best one, he was great. Akinama was young and right out of, right out of, I guess he was in college, wasn't he an amateur wrestler or something? And there's some more of them in there, Ogawa, Ogawa, and if you name off some more, it's just been a while, what's some more of them guys? Uh, you also worked with the veterans, Bobo was still working. Yeah, yep, uh, work with Bobo, yeah, yeah. He does work with the young guys like Momoda. Uh-huh, uh, yep. Uh, what's one? He was a Tawei, Tawei, and Kawada. Yeah, yeah. Kawada was good too. Yeah. And uh, um, um, who else? Name off some more. There's some more of them there. I, can't remember. I hear their names. I remember now. A lot of them are running the place. Those were most of the high high profile guys. You probably worked with all of them though. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you went back to WW, uh, you went back to WWF, and I guess Cornette hit. Made a deal with Vince at, when he was wrapping up Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and he, he took care of some of the guys that were good to him in Smoky Mountain yeah. Wrestling, yeah. and uh, he got you a brief run with WWF. What was the story behind it? Yeah, um, when he shut down, he asked me, and he said it'd take a while, and I said sure. So I went back, and we were, I was working around home in Tennessee and doing independence, and I think I started with him sometime like the first of the summer of '96, mm -hmm. and. Um, Went up there and visited with them. They ask you creative, ask you all the questions, everything, and they came up with that name, Freddie Joe Floyd, which was uh, Jack Jack Briscoe's first and middle name, and Floyd is I think Jerry's first name, something like that. And they really were originally from Bowlegs, Oklahoma, but uh, uh, and uh, so they the start name was kind of a tribute to Jack and Jerry, yeah, who were both yeah, events. yeah, and um, I, I don't know. Um, I just remember this. This is, let me do this here. I don't work for them anymore. They fired me twice. It don't matter. Um, I can remember sitting at the table, and I can remember Jerry Briscoe sitting right here, come over talking to me. And I didn't know where the name came from. You know, I didn't know. I, I just knew I had a job, and I knew that's what they were going to call me and doing, you know, and that. And I said, like, okay. And, uh, um, and I can remember uh, Jerry, they told me where it came from and everything. And then, um, um, Jerry said something about in the Florida Territory that, um, yeah, that, that they had a guy in there named Larry Briscoe that was doing jobs, and when he said that, Vince lit up. He lit. I thought I knew that I was in trouble. <laughs> and, he, and he said, he said, uh, he said that uh, Jerry called down there and and was upset because uh, you know they were jobbing him out and using the Briscoe name. Like that, and he goes, "Oh, I bet Jack didn't like that." When he said that, I went, "Oh God," <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then I heard the banjo music, you know, and I thought, "Oh man, I had these bands on like Shazam, you know, and the green tights and green boots," and uh, um, and I, I knew I was in trouble. But it started out okay because they did that little thing with Bradshaw, and then we, they were going. They talk about putting Savio and I together because they never really put anyone. Uh, that usually tag teams looked alike, dressed alike and everything, but he was Puerto Rican and I was a country boy. We did some a uh, couple things there with Dutch and Bradshaw. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, I think Cornette got some heat with some of them, with Sean and some of them, and whew, you know. So, so when he sees you coming out as Freddie Joe, Joe Floyd and he sees Tony Anthony coming out as Teal Hopper, did, uh, did you get any ribs or did uh, Cornette say anything? Because, I mean, those are almost gimmicks that it's destined to be short-term or fail. No, I think uh, uh, he was kind of, uh, I guess, uh, fading out with his position there, mm -hmm. you know. And he was managing Vader, I guess, then. And then shortly after is when he, not long, um, he started doing uh, the developmental thing in Ohio Valley, you know. So, and there toward the end, uh, I, you know, I saw it was up for me because my thing was up. You know, pretty much at one year. So I you had for. one. You had a one-year guarantee. Yeah, 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 and. Uh, um, I was doing independence around that, and then uh, Candido, Chris Candido, uh, was had started working for Paul E, and he got me booked uh, 
I, and I checked to see if it's okay. You know, he got me booked for ECW at the arena. I was in Hartford, Connecticut that day and made the arena that night. And then after that, I started working. Paul booked me, and uh, I was in Kuwait when they did their first pay-per-view. And uh, um, and then when I got back, I did uh, uh, some house shows for them and a couple of TVs. And I still worked for Paul, and uh, for a few months there. And then that was up. I was done there. And then I worked for Paul E and got independence around that. Okay. Sometime after uh, leaving uh, WWE. Uh, Paul Heyman got in touch with you and asked you to come aboard uh, for his new territory, ECW. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that first phone call? Well, uh, Shane Douglas had a few times uh, before that, before I started for Vince, had called me and I was already booked and things like that when they were first getting going. But uh, Candido is, was helping Paul and Dreamer and Taz and those guys. And when I was working for them, I was at a TV somewhere and he said they needed somebody to come in and work with, with Terry Funk to get Terry over, uh, somebody out of the territory, you know, um, for them to get ready because Terry was fixing to uh, take the belt off of Raven at the first pay-per-view. So uh, uh, Cand I went through Candido and he talked to Paul and, and those guys and got it set up. And I, I did the 3 o'clock show at Hartford, Connecticut that day and caught a ride up to the, to the arena that night. And I think I had the, uh, they were doing the Raw course on Mondays. That was on Saturday. And I had a Sunday somewhere at Candido that got me booked there. So Chris, Chris did that. Chris, Chris uh, talked to Paul. So when you were initially brought in, it was basically in the short term just to get Terry over, and they didn't yeah. have any other plans initially? Well, didn't, you know, with there, you get there and see what happens, kind of, mm -hmm. like that, and got there, and uh, uh, I think first, then they said uh, uh, I was going to work with uh, uh, Van Dam that night because Lance Storm couldn't, they didn't, couldn't make it, something happened with his flight out of Canada or something like that, and then uh, ended up I worked with Taz. Worked with Taz because you know the Taz and Sabu were fixing to do the pay-per-view right there, the first pay-per-view, and worked with him, and that went good. And Taz liked the match, and you know, and after that they said I had a job. Mm -hmm. So, and then that, that Kuwait tour was coming up, and I said then I said, look, I've got this date, this date, and can I do this? Go to do the Kuwait thing because I knew that that would be good, and I really wasn't figured in on the pay-per-view. Right. And then the second time I worked for him is when they put me with Guido and Tommy Rich. What was your first impressions coming into the ECW arena? I think that was your first venue that you... Yeah, that was wild. It was different. It wasn't what I was used to. But uh, it was it was a great locker room, great bunch of guys. It was like a, God, it was like a bunch of misfits. You know, it was like a bar almost. But I knew a lot of people there from other places. So uh, it was, you know, it was different than Vince's. Vince's is real business-like, everything to a T, you know, and doing there. It just... I think New Jack got in a fight. Some guy snuck in or something uh, through that one hole up at the top right there, and a uh, uh, black guy. And all I heard New Jack say, is, uh, I heard him say something like, I don't know you, nigga, like that. Next thing I knew, he was beating him up, going down the steps, and everybody was hitting the guy and everything and did. And I went and grabbed Jack, and I said, Jack, it's me, Tracy. Don't, you know, don't get in trouble with this guy. And of course, that happened all the time there, and that guy was out of there, man. The guys were just, oh, man, it was crazy. That happened about once a month, something like that, <laughs> riots or something, you know. Whose idea was it to put you uh, with the FBI? Because everybody had seen you on TV doing a traditional mm -hmm. Southern thing and then to put yeah. you in with the Italian. They'd already did that, put Tommy with Guido, mm -hmm. uh, my first time there, uh, which was a few weeks before that. They do it about every three weeks. They put Tommy with Guido, and Paul liked the reaction of that because, of course, Tommy not Italian. And, and, uh, um, and then that second time there, I, I wasn't used to that either. Usually you knew who you were working with. And Paul would do a lot of things on the fly. And, uh, I mean, it's like 15 minutes for bell time, you know. And, of course, they never would start on time, you know, in, in 8, 15, 30 minutes, whatever. Like, but I uh, uh, asked Sabu, I says, uh, Sabu, I said, you know who I'm working with? So he goes, hold on, I'll find out. I was like, okay. So he went up and asked Paul, and Paul was doing right there. And Sabu went up to him and, and says, who's Tracy working with? He goes, I don't know, you want to work with him? He goes, no, no. He goes, I need a... a to get over strong he's just got here you know like i need to get over strong tonight for thing was with taz and then next thing i know tommy dreamer come over and asked me if if i want to do the you know uh italian thing with guido and i said sure so long as i got a job he was yes great right there so did a did a tag that night with chris chetty and me worked with tommy and guido and then uh they had me not tag in and then turn on chris and then they put us with put us together from then there were some of the Promos that you did, some of the, the funnier ones. Yeah, uh, the one with Van Dam, where he was doing the Mr. Monday Night thing, 
and uh, that one, a few others with the pizzas and stuff. It was, it was a lot of fun. Those promos, how much do direction do they give you, or did you just kind of, they just said, fill some time, and you just came up with something? They, they give you the points to get across and kind of do it in your own words, and, you know, and he'd do it after the show, 2 o'clock in the morning or something, a lot of times in different places. But uh, uh, one time we rode around somewhere we were at for an hour for him to find a spot he wanted us to do, you know. He was like that, you know, but... Uh, did uh, Paul ever ask you to, uh, you know, be like a, a leader in the locker room? You were one of the older guys, you and Tommy were... You know, They'd of get in the ring and work out before the matches, and I, I got in there one day and just started just messing around with Spike, just like working a shoot, you know, wrestling and stuff and do, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and a lot of the young guys would get around. I'd just start talking to them, and Paul asked me if, uh, if I'd work out with some of them and, and guys coming in. You know that they were taking a look at, so uh, I started doing that. I did it for about two years, something like that. So it was your job before the show to get in there with it. Yeah, we get in the ring about 4:30 or 5, up to about you know about two hours, and uh, the you know Roadkill, uh, Danny Doran, uh, Chris Chetty, uh, Guido, uh, a lot a lot of the Nova, mm -hmm. a lot of those boys uh, would all work out in the ring, and guys would come in and they'd take a look at them, and and I'd have them do calisthenics and hit the ropes and just see what, you know, in little, you know, just work out and stretch out good. And then I'd have them chain wrestle. And then I'd have them work a match, like a five minute match. And some guys that they wanted to take a look at, I'd let them kind of lead it, lead the match, you know, with that. And I'd let them call it in the ring mm -hmm. a lot of times, which is, of course, you know, uh, uh, the veterans, that's how you learn how to work. And, uh, and they learn how to lead it and it helped them a whole lot. And they, you knew they were gonna make it, you mm -hmm. know. and. Uh, a lot of guys come through there doing that. Uh, Rhino, Steve Carino, and uh, several others. You, know. you, you, you had already seen a territory that was dominated by one person trying to do it all, go down with Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Do, could you see some of the stuff that Paulie was doing where that was too similar to what you saw Cornette doing? Yeah, he, he had a lot on him, I guess. And, and uh, uh, he'd do everything at the last minute, I guess, and that kind of hurt. And uh, he just had so much going, you know, it was tough. And a lot of times it hurt them because you wouldn't get your plane information until the that night before, or sometimes the morning of, you know. And of course that's a lot more expensive. And I, you know, I don't know what else went on there, but uh, he had a lot on him. And uh, Dreamer would handle a lot of the merchandise, mm -hmm. and he'd handle that, you know. Uh, you uh, you left uh, you left ECW at one point. You came. I think you came back later. Was it, when you left that one time, was there was there any reason? I got let go. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, uh, they a lot of guys. It was, I guess, they were having financial problems, and uh, uh, they started really just flying the top guys in, mm -hmm. and they had a lot of young guys driving in, and and then you know wasn't paying them quite what they were paying some of the veteran guys. So I was in there with a lot of guys that did, but then when they were local around in the area, where it's driving distance, Dreamer would 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 get me booked on them through Paul, of course, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Cornette would get me booked some with Vince when they were in the areas, extra of the TVs and some house shows, and I'd do independence and mm -hmm. for a few months there. And, and you eventually became a, a trainer in, in the Memphis area for WWF. Yeah, 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 I was there like six months, I guess. Six, who six lined months. that up? Uh huh? Who lined that up for you? Um, Bruce Pritchard. Mm -hmm. Bruce Pritchard and uh, Terry Golden was uh, running the thing then. Yeah, they were running that then. What, what kind of things did you do there? Just uh, try to get them ready to, to, to go up to, I guess, then they were just doing smack, uh, Raw and not SmackDown. And, uh, um, yeah, they were doing that. And uh, it was, that's, that was a hard job. That was a hard job because you didn't know what was coming next. And uh, uh, Terry, he's not in the business anymore. He was kind of, and I hate to say it, but it's true, but a lot of guys there uh, were young guys, and Terry used to was working. He didn't anymore because he had a bad, bad knee or something. And he never made it. And he's kind of bitter at the guys that you know that were trying to get there. And he'd make it hard on them, and they didn't really want to work out or, or anything, and just their attitude, you know what I mean? And make them work hurt when he really shouldn't have made them work. You know, there's a time and place for for everything, and it wasn't real professional on some things, and uh, um, so. There's a difference. It, it just, he didn't have much respect for the business or the people in it. And he would tell the office what he would tell them. And guys were complaining, you know, because of what he was, things he was doing. Just a lot of, it was bad. And it'd make it hard on me to get them motivated to do anything. And, uh, uh, and it was tough. And I was, just got divorced, and I'll say that, you know, and, and 
some problems with immediate family, so it wasn't just wasn't really a good time, you know. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's 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 pretty much it, you know. But uh, it was when I got there on my first day, I knew I'd be there maybe six months. <laughs> I've been around long enough to know that, and that's what. And they paid me for another three, and you know, so that was that was that was okay. Uh, they flew you out west to work for XPW for uh, you know a short-lived promotion. Uh, mm -hmm. Just I, I won't spend too much time talking about XPW, but just throwing those words out there. Is there anything that comes to mind? Uh, Sabu and, and, and Shane Douglas got me booked on that, and I did it before I did the trainer thing, and I did it a little bit after, um, you know, um, in there. And uh, they, he wasn't a wrestling guy; he was a pornhole guy, and he didn't know. And he, I guess he spent a lot of money where he shouldn't, you know, and lost a lot of money, and then he got in some trouble with that Messiah kid, I guess. And then uh, uh, a finger got cut off or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And then he had problems with uh, uh, the pornhole thing in Pittsburgh underage girl or something, that was it, that was it. Uh, you went back to, uh, I guess, the ECW, now the, the WWE brand of ECW for the one night stand. Mm -hmm. How much notice did you have that you were gonna go back for that show? Oh, um, um, I started really back working this February as far as trying to get my head in it, and uh, uh, I'd heard about that they were gonna do it, and I talk, I still talk with Guido some, Nunzio, I talk with him some, and uh, he gave me Dreamer, Tommy Dreamer's number, Hey, you know how it is, if they're going to do something like that, if they got your number, it's right there. If they got to go looking for it, they won't look very long, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of guys they can get. So I just called Tommy up and left a message and uh, just said, hey, I'd love to do it. If you could use me, this, 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 I'm back working. And took a little job when I quit my job up in Rockford, uh, working maintenance ground and security at apartments and trying to get back in the gym and get back in ring shape, which, you know, that's hard. Left the message, said, Here's just my, this is my home cell, my email, my website, you know, everything. And then uh, uh, just for uh, Tommy, he ended up, he called me, and uh, um, Shane Douglas called me a few days before Tommy did and booked me on that hardcore homecoming in Philly. And, of course, you know, wherever you can get booked, you know, so uh, did that. And then when Tommy called me, uh, I didn't know what to say at first, and he said, you want to come aboard? And I went, well, he goes, it's okay if you work Shane's show because a lot of guys are doing both. And I said, well, all right, man, great, I'm there. Thank you, you know, so that, that was it. What was the, uh, I, and I guess to, you can answer this for both the, the Hardcore Homecoming and the One Night Stand. What was the, the backstage like? Because you probably revisited a lot of friends of your childhood. Oh, yeah. Years. Yeah, it was good to see a lot of guys I hadn't seen in years in, in Philly. It was a good time. Good to be at the arena. The people were live. They were with it. And, of course, it's crazy, as always. You know, and then had that, I guess, their ECW feel, which is what they wanted. And uh, obviously did good, you know, DVDs. And, you know, their, their, their gate was good. And they did good on merchandise. And uh, uh, at the one night stand, they had the same feel, and the people were just really live and into it. Of course, the WWE office, and but but it looked like Vince let him do it, you know, ECW style or however, whatever you want to call it, Paul style or whatever. And because uh, he was there at the monitor, you know, with uh, uh, with Vince, and and uh, you know, and then they of course they had the guys up top, Bradshaw and them, all out there, uh, you know, doing what they were doing. So. Did you yeah. hear any comments on, uh, I guess it was the, the Saturday show, the homecoming show, of guys who were not booked on the Sunday? Any negative comments towards it? No. No, not much. Not much. I guess uh, the legal team sent them a lot of stuff that they couldn't do. They had to, you know, block out all the ECW chants, like, like that thick, you know, of stuff they couldn't do. And they had a lot of problems with that. But, uh, you know, everybody's just glad to be there. It was, just, it was a good time. It was a good show. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talk about at the one night stand. There's a, there was an incident that you know made internet headlines at least with the Blue Mini and JBL, and you were just backstage during that time. Can you just talk about what happened, what you saw? I saw in the ring. I saw Bradshaw hit him in the back of the head, <laughs> and he clubbed him a few times. It's just a blur, you know. Cause everybody's in there at once, and there's some hard feelings there. I guess Mini had said something about him on a. Uh, on a internet interview or something, called him a bully or so he called it, you know, I didn't know anything, any of that. And all, all I saw was I was over here at the front and that big, this is in the ring when this happened. And I, that big Matt Morgan, you seen that guy? Mm -hmm. God, he's a big, strong guy. He grabbed me, about broke me in half. And I'm like, I'm down low because I didn't know where these guys' heads were at or nothing because there'd been a lot of tension stir. You know how it is, you know. And everybody was fine to me all day, the off, everything. And I said, hey, I'm 43 years old. I'm a beat-up old man. I, 
I don't know if I could hang one of them jacked up androids in a fight. You know, and and uh, you know, and uh, uh, of course you just you didn't want any you didn't want to, you didn't want any problems because you wanted to be business and be professional and do. And you were hoping that they were going to do something with ECW, and you was hoping you know you get a job, a regular job, not have to fall around and work for a different, which is fine, good to do. But you always like having a base and get independence around it. So I didn't want any trouble. But this is what all I saw was this. I was over here, and I can remember looking, and I can remember seeing Meany going over here, and I can remember seeing Bradshaw hit him in the back, and you just think, good Lord, like, what are you doing? And I knew Meany had staples in the back of his head, you know, and then I'm tied up with that Tomco kid, good God, that man's strong, you know, I, and, and uh, uh, you know, and then I looked up, and I went over to Steve Regal, and I said, come on with me, we're safe, Steve, about that time he fed around and did, and Sandman hit him in the head with that stick. My like, God, you know, like that. And then I looked around, and I went over to Bradshaw, and a couple of things. Uh, he said something, F you or something. I don't remember what it was he said. And I was just like, what? And I went, bam, I reached up and I hit him. You know, because he, he hit me in the back. He hit me kind of right there and did. And then I spun off of him after that. It wasn't really nothing, you know, right, really right there. But um, then I looked around, and Sandman had him around the neck. And it had, it went up behind him and had him, uh, uh, had him with that stick, had him around the neck. And I'm, I, found it, I went over and popped him a few times. I don't think I heard him, but I didn't say nothing. I left it all in the ring. You know what I mean? That, that, I hit him a few shots there. And, uh, uh, and when I got backstage there, that's when, uh, uh, you know, uh, didn't really know what was going on. I mean, Meany turned me around and said, Bradshaw shot on me. And he was blood juiced, you know. I was like, whoa, I guess, what in the world? You know, like that. And that's when they were doing that with Bischoff, when they're taking him down. And then backstage, Bradshaw and Meany were having words, and I could hear Meany going, yo, dude, it's a work, it's a work. And then Meany said something to Bradshaw, well, don't get cocky, and that big kid Orlando was holding Bradshaw back, and the agents, you know, and Johnny Ace was there keeping that, you know, uh, um, you know, Oh, that situation, and, and I was just like, wow. And I didn't say nothing because nobody said nothing to me, and I didn't, you know, I didn't go take it no further and, until uh, uh, I was um, I was home Monday, and I was dead. I was exhausted. I was physically wore out. I'd done Tuesday, Wednesday, two, double shot Thursday, did Shane's Friday, did Ian's at the arena that Saturday, did the pay-per-view at night. I had two days off, and I'd go right back working. And I'd been going a lot. In May, I had 25 shows, June 28, July 28, August 20. 6, 27, went to England tw in October, August. I went to Germany in there and done. I was, I ain't done that kind of schedule since 2001. I'm an old man, you know? And, you know, but, but I didn't want any trouble, but it came out on the internet what happened with me and Bradshaw in the ring. And I, people start calling me, emailing and everything. I didn't want to say anything. And that was on the money because I didn't want any trouble. I didn't want to get heat with the office or anything. And then I get to a show and was told that Bradshaw said I sucker punched him when he's holding Sandman, which I did. <laughs> and I did. So, so when you but, go back, just to interrupt, so when you said you were punching uh, Bradshaw, you weren't just working punching, you were laying him in. No, I was trying to get him what I could, you yeah. know, best I could, best I could. <laughs> but uh, right when he was being held, let's put that in. But uh, he's right, I did. But, uh, 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 but you know what, fuck him. Because he has no respect for this business of the people in it when it comes. Because he's up there making fun of everybody and everything else. Do whatever you like it or not, approve whatever you do. It's our business. It's our business. He wants to call everybody garbage and everything he wants to do. He was talking trash all day. And everything. that's John. That's just the way he is. But one thing about them Texas guys, if you had a tr problem with them, Dick Murdoch, Stan Hansen, you know, Bruiser Brody, the Funks, any of them guys, Harley Race, he wasn't from Texas, but guys like that. You know right where they're coming from. They weren't going to sucker punch nobody in the back of the head or nothing. They come at you straight up. You do what you were in for. You better look out, you know. And uh, uh, that's the way they were. But it wasn't like it with him. They didn't think that took a lot of guts. But I thought, what? Saying I sucker punched him and, and look what he did. Mm -hmm. like that. So that's when the next show I was at, they had me do the interview and shoot on Bradshaw. And that's the one that got all over the Internet and everything that did. And, and, you know, that, and, which it helped me. It helped me a lot. It helped me a lot on bookings. I was slammed after that, you know, and, and, and did. And, uh, um, you so, know. so you, I mean, in that interview, go ahead, uh, for the people who didn't see it, tell us, tell us what you said. I, um, I just said, you know, I said, you know, said that altercation with Blue Meaning and all that, this is this. I said what I said there. I said, you know, you want to say I sucker punched you. When you were being held by Sam, man, I did. I did it. And I'm going to hit you some more. Whenever this time, any place, any time, any place, anywhere. This isn't an interview. This isn't nothing. This is a shoot. When I see you, I'm going to kick your fucking ass. I didn't say that word. Mm -hmm. I said I'm going to kick your. You know, 
this, 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 and uh, uh, you know, and I still mean that. I really do because uh, I, I'm sure it's got back to him, and he's several inches taller, several inches, you know, heavier, so uh, younger, and whatever else. And I'm, I guess he's tough. I don't know, but uh, I, I feel that way because I didn't think that was cool him trashing everybody because I. I Heard about you know on the commentary what he said and he's up there making fun of everybody in the ring and everything and I didn't think that was cool I still don't I really don't and I'm not saying I can kick his ass or nothing but we'll we'll find out we'll see I'm not hard to find I got everything to gain nothing to lose I'll say that you know what I mean you know, he, he ain't getting no cherry here but he's got to do it every day but hey he's a smart guy he's a smart guy he's a good businessman wrote a book good stock market and. Definitely been on top and done nothing but done well. So he wasn't like that when he started. I knew John uh, um, Hawk. I didn't know JBL. You know, two different people. Mm -hmm. He got a talk show, I guess, and all that. And did, you know, but I didn't think he didn't take a lot of guts to hit Meany. Uh, he's harmless as a butter knife. You know, he don't hurt nobody. Mm -hmm. Monkey knows what tree to climb. That's why I said that in an interview too. I just more or less challenged him, and I meant it. I still do. It ain't got to be in the ring. But, I ain't saying I can win. I ain't saying he can, he can go. Well, you but, know, I've asked a couple of people in the past, so like, you know, who, who are some of the tougher guys? Who's the one of the guys you would want to get a, in a fight with? And a lot of people bring up your name. I don't know. Do. I don't know if there's a, there's a reason. You're giving people a reason. To... <laughs> I don't know. I can't already walk to the bathroom over here. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, you just do what you got to do. You just survive. I was taught by the old school guy. I mean, all of them, you know. I've been in the ring with all those, a lot of those guys I mentioned. And, and uh it's, uh, um, you ain't got to be bigger, stronger, faster. You just got to be able to outlast them. You just got to be a little bit meaner. You mm -hmm. just got to want it just a little bit more. And that's the way it is. First of all, you got to have respect for this business. And if you don't, I don't care who you are. I don't care where your position is, what you've done, how much money you've made. You ain't worth a fuck. Excuse my language, but you're not. And that's how I was taught to do. And, and I didn't think that was very respectful. Uh, you know, not at all. But, uh. What was the, you asked me who were some of the toughest guys I've been in the ring with? No, no, I, I just mentioned the fact that a lot of people that I asked about, when they, and I said, who are some tough guys that we wouldn't expect? Your name just happens to come up. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to say any, say there ain't no secret. I just try to survive. I guess that's all you say. You just do what you got to do. You just do what you got to do. I grew up hard. That thug thing wasn't wrestling. It wasn't from wrestling. It was the clicker guys I ran with. and just rough country boys, you know, and uh, back then you'd, you'd be, be on, on the farms, so everybody, they'd, they'd have big barbecues and everything, and I'd, they'd throw guys out there, they'd stir them up to fight always over a girl, something like that, and they'd, farms, they'd bet, them, bet on them, you know, just like, they, I guess, the ultimate fight. They'd been doing that where I lived for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was a young kid in their early teens, having to do it with guys in their 20s, and um, you know, and just and I've worked out with different martial arts guys and some shoot fighters and some boxers and do a little bit on my own basketball player. A different kind of conditioning, really, just keep up with guys. And I ain't been really doing it, but I need to get back doing it, especially talking trash like this. <laughs> but no, hey, you know what? I love everybody. But you know, talking trash like this really helps someone like you. I mean, you know, you're you're a survivor on the independent scene. It's a tough market out there. It sure is. It sure is. But I've worked for a lot of people and helped a lot of people along. When I get more out of helping young guys learn how to do it and I've had to I've went some of these independence guys and I've fought, had to fight guys that because they really think you're like your character is mm -hmm. you know like it is and I'm not here I'm God of mine they've worked to their hundred if they work with me but I've had some instances with guys you never even heard of that were ex-boxers shoot kickboxers whatever you want and just and had been sucker punched in the ring things like that and do and you just you just do what you got to do to survive I mean I've had I've heck when I got out of the business I, I bounty hunted I repoed cars, I was a bodyguard, I was a collector. I did all that and did that. And, that, and I got out 2001 and did that on and off until February of this year and did. So, and, and I'd see all my friends dying, you know what I mean? You know, and it's just so sad. You know, got Chris Candido, Hawk, uh, Kurt Henney, you know what I mean? I know I'm going off on subject to subject, it just hurts to see it. Eddie Guerrero, God bless him, man, God bless him. And it's sad. And you see like Vince getting on there and gloating about uh, his ruthless aggression and things like that. And he shut all the territories down, and that just pisses you off big. And I've had guys take cheap shots at me off the thing with John Collins. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Uh, he would put a lot of heat. Uh, he did the main event thing. He scammed a lot of guys. and did, That got a lot of heat on me. But, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I know. Okay, that's right. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I don't know. You know, 
you know, because it, it, you put your trust in certain people, promoters, and they come and go and stuff, and, and your name, your name's always attached to things like this. I mean, how, yeah. you know, I guess you just have to make those decisions based upon your experiences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You, you, you don't ever know. I mean, it's, uh, I tell you what, well, I got out in 2001 and it started really back some in 2003 a little bit, and 2004 a little. It's like them old Road Warrior movies after 911. When WCW shut down, then 911 hit, it's kind of like them old Road Warrior movies, Mad Max, we're all killing each other for gas. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I wrestled a bear. I wrestled three different bears. Uh, three nights in a row one time, that was back in the 80s. They don't, they won't let you do that anymore. And, and that was dangerous. <laughs> but uh, survive, you know, like I said, you just do what you gotta do. Because back then, if you didn't take the book and do it, you were fired. Mm -hmm. You were fired. You know, if you got beat up in a bar fight or a street fight, all that, you were done. You were finished. I was going to ask you about a match that we're going to roll tape on uh, as, as you talk uh -huh. about this. Uh, you were in a match with Lex Luger in Spartanburg yeah. earlier this year. Uh, you know, Lex has been going through some of his, his problems, and he showed up that night in probably not his best condition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you deal with these things in the ring every day, even when you're talking about yeah. 41, 42 years old. Can, tell us some of your memories of that particular match. Yeah, uh, you know, he had that happen with Elizabeth and all that and the felony counts and every, all the, whatever, all the trouble he ended. I think he had just gotten, went to court and, and I guess he got probation, had to do community service and all that. And he was uh, uh, just emotionally wrecked. You know what I mean? He really was. He had a lot on him. And, uh, and I think he uh, really cared about Elizabeth. That's what I kind of got. Because I always got along with Lex Fine, but he wasn't in real good shape. He was in better shape by the time we went to the ring. And... To me, the challenge of, of being a professional is the fact that you want to go out and turn that negative into a positive. Have a good match and do. Because I was trying to get, I, Shane had called me that morning, matter of fact, and booked me on the Hardcore Homecoming. I didn't put the call in a dreamer. And I was, I mean, it's like starting over for me. I was working hard to try to get back in the mix because I had not been since 2000, really. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, uh, and so I really wanted to have a good match with Lex that night, and I knew, you know, I'd heard bad stories. That he, and I couldn't believe it when I saw him, and talked with him, and I was just like, man, dude, you know, you got to kick out, bud. I said, if that's over and that's done with, and, and it's all dropped, and you got to do your everything you got to do, do it, straighten up, get it together, man. Come on, you know, I never thought I'd see you like, you know, like that. And he was like looking at me like, yeah, I know, I know, and he was trying, but he had just had a problem, and I heard he's doing a lot better. I think I'm gonna see him Friday. And we'll see him been, tonight, I think. Oh, tonight? Mm -hmm. Well, good. I heard he was doing a whole lot better, but he was, he was not in good shape. He wasn't in real good shape. He was better time he went to the ring, and we set up a couple things he did and called it in the ring, and he kind of started fading the stomach a little bit to come back. I said, "Come on, Lex. Come on, Lex. Keep coming." And he got through it and did, and it came off okay, I guess. And and it helped me. The boys in the back was just like, "Hey, good job. This is you know for going out and having and, and getting the match." over best as you could, you know, and did, and uh, because they knew Lex wasn't in, in good shape and in good, the best of state of mind. But I guess since then he's doing better. I hope so. I'm going to ask you about, about a couple of names, just maybe cover some stories that we haven't hit from, from one angle or another. Some of these names you brought up, uh, some mentioned some guys that you worked with in the past. How about Jamie Dundee? <laughs> he's in jail. Did you know that? Third time for child support. Daring to pay $50 a week. You know, he got said about six more months, something like that, and I guess it'll be up. But he was great talker, great worker. Of course, his dad, Bill Dundee, and it's such a waste that, uh, as a matter of fact, I got on one of my DVDs a match with, I had with him, like two falls, went 30 minutes with 30, 45 minutes with him. You'd see, it was sad to see. It was, I guess it was in 97, 95, maybe, something like that. But, uh, boy, he, was, he, he could really work. He was good, man. It's a, it's a shame. It's a real shame. It's a crying shame. You alluded earlier to Buzz Sawyer yeah. working with him. Yeah, Buzz Sawyer was out of this world. I'm going to tell you what, uh, if he was alive today, he could still get over. He, he, he was great. He was, he was crazy, man. He, but he always liked me. He always liked me. He'd make me look good back then. It was hard to do, but he would. I worked with him in 86 for Bill Watts when he's finished up his program with Duggan, and we went like almost 20 minutes in a TV title match thing, an opening match in Jackson, Mississippi. Made me look, I never went that long in my life. And he made me look like a million dollars. He really did, and that was tough to do. And then, of course, worked with him a lot in Japan when him and Manny Fernandez were a team. And he was always good to me and treated me good and did because I'd listen to him. And I always liked, you know, I was a mark. I loved watching his stuff in Atlanta when I was in college. I'd watch him go kick ass. Him and the Road Warriors when the Georgia Championship Wrestling was going. But God bless him, you know, because I'll tell you what, he, he, he was way ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. He was something else. 
He could do any style you wanted. He was over big in Japan, and he's so crazy. He got so much heat in the States, you know, but uh, he was great in the ring. How about Eddie Gilbert? I don't know yeah. how well you knew him. But. Yeah, real well since I started. His dad is, of course, his brother, uh, Doug. Uh, Eddie, uh, in 83 when I started was there and they, the Fabs had went to, uh, uh, Steve and Stan went to AWA to Vern's and then Eddie and Tommy Rich were doing their, uh, the fabulous one thing there when they started and Eddie went back on his own. Eddie had come from New York, Tommy come from Atlanta and then in 86 uh, Eddie had a hand in the book with Taylor and Dick Slater. Kind of had a lot of input and uh, worked with him some there and went around 30 minutes with him and he, he made me look good and learned a lot from him. Good mind, real good mind for the business. Crazy, God bless him. God right. bless him. How about, uh, you talked about Chris Candido and his uh, and Tammy Sitch. Mm -hmm. what, what, were your, what were your memories of when she came in the business in Smoky Mountain Wrestling? Yeah, she had to look and, and had the Hillary Clinton, um, she had the Hillary Clinton, um, you know, had the Hillary Clinton look in all the interview and she was Jimmy's project. You know, he brought her in, her and Chris. And, uh, uh, got over instantly and uh, she needs to get it back together and lose her weight and get her head right and get off the drugs and do and she could do what she did she just got to go back to what got her there when her dad passed away she was never the same worked program with her when she was with brian lee and then uh, uh then with chris was after that and we were in uh newport tennessee i remember being at a fair ricky morton was helping jimmy with the book and uh tony atlas was, was gonna be there tonight right His, was coming in and I was going to work with Tony, and they were going to put Tammy with Tony, white girl with the black guy thing, and that, you know, like that. Well, Tony didn't, ended up, didn't come, and, and Tony didn't come, and they didn't have nobody for me, and Chris had just finished, and they put Brian Lee with Tony Anthony in the program, with Tammy, was involved in that too, with white girl, and uh, uh, they didn't have, Chris Candido had just finished up uh, working a program with Tim Horner. And they didn't really have nothing for Chris. So I was asking Ricky, I said, well, what's going on? He goes, I don't know. It's kind of in limbo. You know, I don't know what's going to happen here. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, who do you think that Jimmy put me with? And he, said, he didn't really know. And I said, what about that kid over there? And he says, who? And I says, the Candido kid. I said, he works his ass off, man. I said, he's got it. Suicide. I said, I want some of him. Suicide blind. You know, because he's a good kid. He really was. And he goes, oh, yeah, he's a great worker. He goes, I don't know if Jimmy has anything for him. He goes, he ain't got any heat on him. He said, uh, uh, Tim never put him over. He said, he's been doing the baby bottles and the diapers and all that. I said, that's okay. I said, drop us down in the middle. Uh, you know, around the first, uh, that'd be good to be off there anyway. Be in the middle, mid card, you know, right there, as you call it, or opening, whatever you want. I said, we can have good matches. I said, I can get him over. I know I can. I said, that guy, he can work us out. He's got it. And the rest is history. He was, he, he was great. Good kid. God bless him. But boy, he, he'd send over spots and write them down and all that. And I was like, good. Well, I couldn't read his writing for one thing. And, and he was just so excited, you know, and just really wanted it bad. And I said, Chris, this is, uh, we'd get together and do. I said, I'll never remember all that. So we'll just call it in the ring. But we'd set it up and do it and then go back. But boy, it was, it was, it was uh, uh, he was ahead of his time back then. He, he was a good kid. Good kid. Loved it. Loved working with him. He got me. I was kind of fading, kind of getting burned out, and he really got me, you know, energized to get back in it. And uh, I'll say this, uh, uh, my New Year's resolution in 2004 was never getting a ring again. And then Ian Rotten uh, sent an email to my site. I was working my job up in Rockford and was running around Chicago. And then I ended up, I called him. And he's like, I said, hey, you want to come in? His IWA thing. He says, you want to come back in and work? I go, I don't know, Ian. I can't. He goes, Candida's going to be there. I said, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. And I uh, uh, stayed in touch with him on the phone and all. And saw him, of course, at the show. And I did the mask thing. And he came out in the ring, grabbed me from behind. I thought it was a mark. I turned around right there, and it's Chris. And we were supposed to work the show uh, together for Ian at that Highland at the IWA. And he couldn't get there. He had a convention that day. He missed his flight. He was stuck in traffic. And then we were supposed to work together, I think, the week after he died, something like that. I talked to him two days. I, I was going through the airport to go, go to Germany, and I um, called him, wished him luck on the pay-per-views, working with TNA, and he broke his ankle. And then so I, I got in on the Sunday night, so I called him Tuesday. And he was, he was down, but he was excited because he was going to keep his job. He's in good spirits, and he said they're going to make him an agent. Let him work the ECW one night stand, the hardcore homecoming. He's going to do all that. And they want him to commentate, possibly. He said Tammy was 15 pounds from where she used to be. He was trying to get back in 
real good spirits. Matter of fact, Jerry Jarrett, he had TV taping that day. That was his last one. And Jerry Jarrett beeped in and called him. He said, it's Jerry, I got to go. And then uh, two nights later, I was coming out of a show, and Shane called me. And uh, I was out, uh, coming out of there, and he said, you hear what happened? I had no idea. And he said, Chris Candido died. And I was like, no way. I just talked to him. And he's like, yeah. And I started crying, he started crying, and then Dixie Carter called for Shane. And then I called my girlfriend right then, and I said, you know, you're hoping that something wasn't, it didn't happen. And it was on the internet, on the, you know, and I just, just couldn't believe it. Still can't. Still can't. Not to jump subject so, so quick, but uh, I want okay. to just talk about Terry Gordy as well. Yeah, I saw him the night before he died. Worked the main event show in Vincennes, Indiana. He'd come up with, uh, yeah, and talked about, we talked for a long time. He was telling me about his son was getting ready to go to the uh, Japanese dojo and uh, start there, Ray, who's in Deep South mm -hmm. now, right? Yeah, and I remember when he was a little kid and then, uh, you know, what happened. You, you, know. s you saw Terry before uh, his accident and you, you saw him when he came back and worked for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Mm -hmm. was, he, was he the same person? No, uh, you know, that, that took a lot out of him when he, when he OD'd in Japan. And it's just, you know, it's mental. He, he, he used to, he was, boy, let me tell you what, in his prime, he was one of the best. He was right there with Stan Hansen, you know, on top for them. And he was just out of this world. And he knew when to do it. He could feel the people. I mean, he could he could come in, and I've seen him passed out on the floor and had, you know, been out partying, drinking, you know, the night before. And just, just you know, wake me up when the bell rings. and go out, call it all in the ring with Kobashi and go 30 minutes and just tear it. He really could. He could tear it down. He was, he started working, he's like 14, had a mask on. And when that happened, he didn't, you know, up here, he was trying physically, but uh, he wasn't physically what he was and, and, and mentally he wasn't. He'd tell you it and he knew it. You'd see glimpses of it sometimes. You really would, but uh, he, he, uh, he just couldn't, you know, he couldn't, it, it was, because of wrestling, you know, our business is a lot a lot of psychology and he, he really had it back then before that happened you know well jade after he od'd and you worked with him maybe in smoky mountain did you were there any limitations like what you could and couldn't do with him in the ring i mean was he mentally was he state was he there enough to sometimes to sometimes it was hit or you know yeah. and, you know sometimes i can remember doing a tag with him in morristown and i did almost yelling at him to get him fired up and do and then god you know, it was like that. It was like the old Terry, but sometimes just like, he used to, before he go to the ring, he'd be you over, just ready to go. Then you'd see me just be like this. You know what I mean? You know, and, and uh, uh, God bless him. Nicest, great guy. God bless him. Put, just to put a kind of a time stamp on when we're doing this interview, this mm -hmm. is days after Eddie Guerrero passed away and, you know, what's rumored to be a drug-related incident. There's so many drug-related incidents involving wrestlers and stuff, and, and the debate for the last couple of days has been, uh, you know, when guys are on the road and stuff, they get addicted to these pain medications, and they do these recreational drugs, and a lot of this stuff, they don't, it's not their fault. It's kind of a, a byproduct of the system that we have. Yeah. yeah. You've been around this, and, you know, I, I'm not going to accuse you of being yeah. involved in drugs or anything like that, but you, I'm going to guess that you've been around people who have been, and you're, you could speak on this subject. Yeah, you know, being on the road is really hard. It really is. And our business beats you up mentally, physically, spiritually. It, it really does. And the mental part of it, because you're not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, guys play hurt. I mean, I mean, they really do. They really do. And uh, uh, one thing leads to another. You know, one drug can lead to another, and somebody can try something or do this or whatever, experiment something to do, and they like whatever, and then next thing you know, they're doing it every day or every night. And uh, personal situations, of course, being away from your family also going to lead to marital problems or girlfriend problems, or uh, and then you don't know what your spot is, if you've got a job tomorrow or not, things like that. And uh, uh, it, it's a lot of different things. It really is. And a lot of it's guys just playing hurt. And traveling. I mean, some guys at uh, you know two o'clock in the morning, they got 240 miles to go wherever they got to go, and they may take some kind of pill to keep them up, something, whatever they do. And uh, uh, you know, and and it can, and then your tolerance and, and it gets higher and higher, and they're taking more and more. And then when the when the business got, I, that's my opinion. I really believe this. When it got where there was less jobs, guys, uh, 
then you started seeing it happen more. When I got out of the business, I almost was scared to get on the internet because one of my friends passed away. Then the guys I knew knew their wives and kids and things like that, and it just make you cry. But uh, uh, when they got inactive and out of work, you know what I mean? It wasn't as much work. They weren't working for an office where they had booking sheets every month, knew they had a job contract, any things like this. When it got to, like I said, like the you know Mad Max Road Warrior thing, where you know, I mean, all bets were off and cancellations, uh, uh, things like that, uh, just got really screwed around, I guess, business-wise by you know certain promoters, offices shutting down, jobs declining. It all leads to that. And some of these guys never done nothing but been in the business. You know what I mean? You know, but since in their teens, and they go out here to the real world. You know what I mean? You know, our business is a fantasy world. What we do, you get caught up in it, dude. Then you go out here and you got to go work an eight, twelve-hour job. You know, a day, and that's a head trip for guys. You know, and what are they qualified for? Some are, some aren't, and that's what uh, I saw happening after nine one one, even before. And uh, I, you know, I think you could look back and see who's with us and who's not, and. Uh, uh, it's not anyone's fault. You just you just got to really be careful. And when you get older too, of course, you, you know you you just can't. If you've had years of years of be, getting beat up down the road traveling, everything you do, uh, the travel alone kicks your butt. It really does. I've I'll tell you this. Uh, uh, for me myself, uh, I started back in February, and like I said, I had all those shows I had. But end of July, I went down physically. I mean, I went down. I had to miss like two a Friday and Saturday or Saturday and Sunday. My body was like rubber. I was getting where I was almost sleeping in the dressing room. I was just exhausted. It, I was run down so hard. I pushed myself so hard, working out. Trying. I was working out. I was eating right. I was resting. But I broke my ribs and I kept working. You know what I mean, like that. And I took ephedrine. I'll just tell you that I took ephedrine from '93 to 2001, and that's not good for your heart. And it got to where I was working every day. And for people who don't know, ephedrine uh, is supposed to keep you slimmer, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that too, and your energy level. I'd take it an hour before I'd work out, and I'd take it an hour before I go in the ring. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, with that too, I'd take, I'll just, I, I don't mind saying, I'd take a Vite, Lortab, uh, you know, or a Percocet. Not, I wouldn't overindulge and do it, but still, you're using yet the next day's energy. But I physically had to do it because this guy over here might be taking triple. You know what I mean? Well, I don't want to say nay or anything right. to do the same thing because he was like working with a broke arm or broke ankle or I've worked with a broke ankle, done all that without anything and, uh, uh, you know, and numerous other injuries. And uh, uh, I did that from 93 to 2001 and that's when I got out and I've got a heart murmur. I've got sleep apnea because of that and uh, I got a valve a little shut, you know what I mean? And I've had 28 concussions and it built up and I didn't know what it was. Uh, uh, really, and until I got checked out, and I went down in July, and then I went down uh, in England after I got back from England. Uh, I had some trouble with my blood pressure. I could feel me going down physically when I was over there, and when I got back, I did a ladder match. I caught a ladder to the head and caught the front of the head right there. But then in the same match, you know what I mean, in the temple, and his cushion didn't know it. September 22nd, I went down, and I had to miss several shows, and and did because I wouldn't take. I, I would. I wouldn't. What I'm saying is I probably wouldn't have went down. Maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I would have died if I'd have took ephedrine or took uh, uh, pain pills because I've had some anxious moments with my heart and my head and I actually thought that I was, you know, I've, I've went to bed and I, my, my girlfriend would tell me irregular breathing. So I got checked out and I got aerotic stenosis and I've had so much scar tissue around my, around my head. I, I got to watch shots of the head. But guys do it because they love it. Like uh, when I saw Eddie in, in June, he looked real tired. He looked real wore down. He looked, he was exhausted. He was physically just wiped, just wiped out. You could just see it. You could see, because I had heard that, uh, God bless him, man, he's a great guy. I had heard that after he lost the, the belt, took, took the belt off him with Bradshaw, that they wanted him to take a break, kind of, because he was playing, he was working hurt. He was real wore down and tired, and, and it does it till you need a break. Because I just really got back going about three months ago since, or three weeks ago since September 22nd. I had to miss a lot of tests. I went and got checked out, and I'm glad I did. You know, I'm glad I did because uh, you push yourself to the point, and I, my body let me know I'm 43. I'm not 23 anymore, and Eddie was 38. And, man, you're talking about a guy that was going with all them big, strong guys, and he works his ass off every night. And, like I said, in his past experiences he had, uh, uh, you know, uh, it caught up to him. It caught up to him. It, it just couldn't go no more. And, you know, 
but that's the way. And then again, it's like this. I know how I feel. A lot of times, I, like uh, this past week, I was in West Virginia for like five days and I had four shots, something like that. And I kind of was worn down, tired. I thought, man, I, I may need to take a break here, you know, because I really felt, you know, really like it was really getting me. And I had to miss a few shows over these past three, you know, here and there, because I just physically couldn't do it. And I knew it, and I knew it. But if you take something, to keep you going, you can, but you're going further than your body will let you. Then the next day, you got to do it again. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and you sleep eight hours sometimes in our bed and wake up just as tired. And if I, you know, I, you just uh, uh, and I maybe I, I felt like if I would have missed those shows, then you know what? I probably might have done something I shouldn't have done. I might have drank a few beers, watched football, might have took a pill or two. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I don't I, I don't know if I'd have took any, pill, but I might have drank more. I ate junk food and I. Uh, if I get out of this business, I'll weigh 400 pounds. But some, sometimes if you're inactive, you understand what I'm saying? Depression, something like that set in. So the fear of that would make you push yourself harder. Do you understand what I'm saying? Definitely. Maybe if he would have took a break here, he might have backslid into what, what would have happened before. And it's hard to say. I, I guess we'll never know. But uh, God bless him because we lost a good one. Chris Candido, too. You know, I... Uh you're, you said 40. Does that make any sense? Does that make yeah, any sense? Makes I mean, sense. because it, it's, it's like maybe the fear, of course, he loves what he does. I don't mean to cut you off. No. He loved what he does, but he felt like, well, if I stop, then maybe, you know, when I when, when get the kids to school or something, I ain't got nothing to do. You know what I mean? You know, that's kind of how it is. And, and, do, and you just, it's, I mean, I had to get a heart monitor on me. And let me tell you what, man, that's a, that's, that's, that's a head trip. That's a head trip. Just to check, you know, regular, they said more or less is when I was sleeping, I got sleep apnea. Like what killed Reggie White. You know what I mean? So I've got to lose weight. I've got to get better. I have to do everything right or I can't do it, you know, and to do on the level he was doing, you know what I mean? You know, because I saw him that day. And he was dead, man. He slept all day in the floor. He was, he was wore out. Because I remember seeing him. I was like, Eddie, you all right? He went, yeah. So he just started. He goes, yeah. He slept all day and then went out with Benoit. And you could see he wasn't, you know, he was real, real. And, and Chris and Chris was real tired. Because they hadn't had a break. I mean, they, and they're going hard with these these big, strong teach. They taught everybody come through there, mm -hmm. every developmental guy, you know. And when you're doing that, that's hard, man. Because these guys don't know how strong they are, you know. And 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 you get accident, you know, miscues, things like that, and you get banged up, you know. One injury leads to three, four others. Right. You understand what I'm saying, Definitely. you know? Because whenever you're favoring that, you get hurt over here, and uh, you know, you don't know it unless you did it, mm -hmm. you know. I like to ask this question of someone who's who's been around this business and seen a lot. Is wh where do you see our business going? I mean, you've you've seen some ups and downs, and you're out there on the front lines now with the working the independent circuit. Where do you see us going? Um, I think that's good. What TNA's doing, I think that's great. It's a lot of more options for the for the boys. Uh, you see some people trying to get things started, but what you see, and I know y'all got to deal with it here. Uh, everybody runs against each other. People pull each other's posters down. It gets the, the, all the bad press. Uh, the bad things happen. Guys getting in trouble. You know how it is. You know what I mean? Like okay, back before, you wouldn't ever hear about. It. Now you hear about it because there's kayfabe sheets. There's the the internet. You know, there's things like that that get it all and it gets a black eye on what we do, and it's not as positive anymore. It used to. The cops pull you over, they take care of. It. Now they'll bust your ass, buddy. They're checking your car, they're checking everything. Because they saw all those drug-related, you know, the deaths mm -hmm. and th bad things that happen. Uh, you, you wish there were more places to work because you see a lot of good young talent, which I know y'all see, you know, all the time. And there used to be a lot more jobs. And then when Vince went in and shut all the territory, he took all the top guys' talent and shut all the territories down, then that dwindled. And you started seeing, you know, uh, he, he, he monopolized the whole business, really. So you want to see, you'd like to see a few people get things going again to provide more jobs. And I think that's why a lot of guys aren't with us no more because of, you know, things like that, you know, and, and it's too bad. What, what percentage of your bookings would you say get canceled on the independent scene? Uh, it varies. Usually if it's, it's like uh, when it rains, it pours. But a lot of times I pick up things and I've worked for a lot of different people and I'll call around and do and, you know, and, and get booked and, and do. But, uh, yeah, it's especially when it gets around this time of year, around holidays, it always slows down because people get tight on money and mm -hmm. things because for Christmas and things like that with their families. Uh, but, yeah, I, it's hard to say, you know. 
It's hard to say. It's usually not too bad, but uh, sometimes, you know, it can switch 42 times. A lot of times I can get canceled over here and I'll call around and say, hey, glad you called because this, this is canceled on me and then this, whatever, you know, guys will double book themselves, mm -hmm. sometimes accidentally, sometimes not. Usually I can pick up, you know, but uh, it's a lot of fun. But you'd like to see it uh, where it was it used to be regional territories that didn't go out of their territory. You know what I mean? They didn't, they didn't necessarily drink a beer and get along, but they didn't go out of their territory for respect for our business. Now all bets are off, you know, I mean. You hear it all the time. Guys get your posters jerked down, get called the commission on them, things like that. You know, and it's all it does hurt hurts hurts the people, the the marks, the fans that pay a ticket because they hear all this bad press. You you know, there's some people that call people and do that, and it hurts our business. So you, you wish it wasn't like that. That's why it's called outlaws. Mm -hmm. you now, Tracy, how do you see yourself? Uh, how, how much longer do you see yourself wrestling? What do you how do you like to see yourself going out? Well. Um, as I was telling you before, I'm hoping to get in with uh, the people I work for in the home health care and remodeling houses, and uh, he sells heavy-duty equipment cleaner. I want to do that, but I still want to wrestle the shows that are good shows, you know, and do it. I'd like to do it until I'm 65. Bob Armstrong's 66. He's still going. I don't strong. know how he does it. He's going strong. Yeah. I'd like to do it. I'll let you end it uh, saying, saying goodbye to all the people who purchased this DVD. Okay. Away. Okay. Well, I hope you buy it.